Well, uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, this is uh, SBT Core Concepts. I'm uh, Eugene Yokoda from uh, Lightband Skeleton uh, and also the SBT uh, current maintainer. So the uh, goal of this talk is to kind of gain better intuition about SBT. I'm going to go over a lot of details today, but don't really worry about like fully understanding like details because the uh, you know the, the whole point is to kind of like see what the design philosophy or the design principles behind SBT and kind of like understand like why and what's happening rather than like the details. So to put it into a little context, um, SBT 0.3, if you Google it, it came out in like December of 2008. So it's actually now a 10 and a half year old build tool. It's pretty amazing. Basically, it kind of trailed right behind uh, the you know the Scala and the uh, so it has a really long history and all these different things. And I've been fortunate to basically maintain maybe last like four or five years of history of you know making it better tool basically. So before I get into the actual talk, I want to just like plug this thing called the SBT by example. Uh, this is one of the reference manual has this one page that introduces you on how to basically use SBT in one single page, starting from uh, the minimal build, which is actually just like touch build.scala, and that's like a blank file, and that's actually a minimal build. And then from there, it basically shows you how to put the like, Scala version in there all the way to how to make a Dockerize application that like, you know, checks the weather or something like that. So it's, uh, if you know someone and you know, if your colleague is asking, how do I get into SBT, this is pretty a good, good start. So what's a build tool? <laughs> all right, it's, so there's a paper that came out last year uh, by uh, Mokov. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it the last name correctly. Uh, Mitchell and actually Simon Pete and Jones wrote this paper called the, uh, the Build System a la carte. Um, using their definition, build system or build tool is something that automates repeatable tasks. Um, so in their sort of like a framework of thinking, Excel is actually a build tool, if you think about it. You set up a bunch of functions, right? And then you plug in some numbers, you're like a quarterly sales or something like that and then the other cells that calculates these numbers. But you basically set something up so that you can repeat that process. And to some, you know, build basically is, there's a lot of things that happens that basically sets up the repeatable tasks. And there are specific designs that the build tool use, uh, which we'll look into. The other aspect, I think, that isn't really specifically set out uh, in the SBT's manual or the Getting Started page, but I just kind of like got to know more and more as I was maintaining SBT. It's, it's a casually functional build tool. And what do I mean by that is that I'm not going to really claim like purely functional build, right? Uh, but it's actually like I sometimes joke that the SBT is one of the build tool that pretends that the side effect doesn't exist. Um, there's a lot of the core philosophy or, con you know, the concept around SBT is based on the uh, functional programming. And there are several key aspects of that, like the, I think, the use of the immutable data structures. Uh, that's one of them. Uh, and the, as we'll get into it, the, it's, it really thinks about how and when the effects are triggered and how it's handled. And it's, you know, there's a lot of thinking towards when and how and how you compose effects. So that's basically what makes it more functional build tool, uh, I think, than the more traditional ones. So, you know, traditional, you know, good, good start pointing, a good starting point for the functional programming, I think, is to think about effects, right? Because by capturing an effect uh, as a data structure, basically you're making the rest of the application more like a repeatable pure function, essentially. 
So there is actually a data structure inside of SVT called state. Um, and what do we track in there is basically we track uh, the, the build structure. And it doesn't really track it, but conceptually, it also maps into your disk. So your source code, your you know, class files, and jars, and libraries, you can think of them essentially as an effect. right? And there is whoops, um, a concept called the command inside of the SVT. And as, as a first kind of like approximation, you can think of command as the state transformation function. Right, so you start off with some sort of state uh, that has some file, and then you do some sort of thing using command, and you go to the next state, right? So that's kind of like a one important thing, is that commands are processed sequentially as like a state monad, you know, like if you're familiar with that. Uh, so basically it maps procedural code, and it's, you have the state, and then you go to another state as you process something using command. And this is fairly low level construct. So if you're like a plugin author is out there, uh, my suggestion actually is to avoid using command or creating, providing command. But it's also important to know that the, what aspect of SBT is handled by command and why it behaves in certain ways. So let's kind of see the examples of a command, all right? Um, one of the helpful command, I would say, is actually help. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you're kind of unfamiliar with SVT, you know, or, or kind of like get to learn more, help is actually a pretty good command. Uh, you know, just type help and just kind of list a bunch of commands in there. Um, tasks is another kind of interesting command that this is not really doing anything, but it's just listing a bunch of like tasks that's, uh, you know, located in your, in your build structure. Um, projects. Project hello, basically these are also listing out the subprojects in your build. Um, set becomes a little more interesting, right? Like a set is basically a command that changes your build uh, by taking the uh, the setting expression. The I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the next one. It's a semicolon command. So command is composable using a multi-command called semicolon. Uh, this, is a, this particular syntax is uh, new to SBT 1.3, uh, which RC2 came out uh, a few days ago. Before, you needed like a semicolon in the front. Uh, so you have to say semicolon command 1, and then semicolon command 2. Uh, in the newer version, it will be command 1, semicolon command 2. But basically, you're able to compose sequentially a bunch of commands. And the other one that more people are maybe familiar with is the plus plus one command that switches the current uh, Scala version and plus plus Scala version bang. Uh, that basically forces a particular Scala version, even if it's not listed in the cross Scala uh, versions list. And plus command basically, you know, issues the command against different versions of the Scala. So again, you know, like these are basically details. You don't have to memorize this. But you can see how command basically is kind of composed almost like stringly, right? Show command is something that you see every day uh, without really not issuing it. It's the actual interactive shell itself is implemented as a command that's querying you to type something in. There's just only one of the command. And then once it it's done, it issues the shell command again. So it's basically a command designed to ask you one question. We get into the act command. The act command is the uh, sort of like a lifting command. Uh, there's more details we need to get into to like explain what this exactly is. But when you type compile, uh, act command is what's actually processing the, uh, the tasks. So getting back to the state, right? So what state are these bunch of things changing? Um, help and task, like I said, I don't think it's really changing your state. But remember, SPT's state concept tracks both the build structure as well as your, as your disk, right? So when you type project hello, 
it's actually changing the build structure a little bit because there is a, one of the build structure is looking at your current project. So that will change the interpretation of when you type uh, compile or test or something like that, right? Because you just switched your current uh, subproject. Uh, set, obviously, that issues on other settings, so that changes the build structure. And the other is basically kind of changes both, uh, depending on what the command one is. And act command, like I said, it affects more your, of your disk because that's where compilation happens. So let's think about like what, why, <laughs> why do we create like state and command, right? Um, this kind of gets back to the the paper of the uh, the build system a la carte, which is that if you think of the uh, you know state to be like a flow of water like this, the command basically kind of gives you like a predictable checkpoint that like the SBT will come to the stop point, right? And it's kind of like this dam. And it's you, the user, you get to change which way the next flow of the water is going to be. Um, so if you want to do like compile or test, uh, that's the sort of a stopping point where it gives you. And this kind of like is designed partially because SPT is an interactive build tool. Like if we didn't have like interaction, you don't really need to have state, right? You just like do your thing. But because we come back to the, you know, the interactiveness, uh, it kind of makes sense to write this in like a state and like the transition of the state. So to kind of like a make a diagram about this, it kind of looks like this, right? So we have a shell, like I say, it's designed to ask exactly one question and you type some command, and the <laughs> effects happen sort of on the side. Um, it almost doesn't matter if the uh, jar file is created or not a lot of times because you know, you're kind of mostly working with the uh, like error message or something like that. The fact that it compiled, it's probably good enough, right? And or like where you're running a test, you're, you're not really looking at the jar of the test, you're actually looking at the result of the test. Uh, so the fact that it failed or succeeded those are more interesting things. And why are they you know, presented as today? These are logs, basically. So you issue commands, and what you get back is the logs. And then the effects kind of happens on the side. Um, next, I want to talk about the, uh, this uh, British movie called the uh, About Time. Um, so like some people call it the uh, 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 time travel, actually, because it's the same, uh, I think, director as uh, Love, actually. And the, I like watching different, like, a movie that involves, like, a time traveling. And the, uh, I think this one, like, you get into the closet, and uh, all the men in the family, they are able to go back to the past point in their life, and then they redo it. Um, and there was this one paper that was written, I think, in, like, 1978 or something like that, called the... Uh, time clocks and the ordering of events in the distributor system. And it's like, a, I, I only read like one or two papers, but this is like one really interesting paper I really recommend. Uh, not just for like people who's interested in like functional programming, but like distributed systems like Akka and stuff. Um, so I'm not gonna get into the full paper that talks about like, you know, logical clock and all that cool stuff. But see, if you're time traveling, one of the things you have to worry about is like, like event coordinations but like just time, right? Like you don't really have a physical clock that works, right? If you think about like the uh, speed of light and observabilities and all that stuff, you can't really rely on physical time. So what you have to actually think about in the distributed systems or even like threads and stuff like that is to think about time without using clock. And this is what like the sort of process the, the up arrow that's going upward, that's actually time that's going up. And you can think of process P, Q, and R as like an individual person, or in our case, like a thread or a program or something like that, right? And the points, like P1, P2, P3, these are called events. So a distributed event, so as long as the some event is happening within a single process, you know, what happened before is pretty easy to track because it's happening within the single, you know, like a clock or something like that, right? So this arrow, this Lamport's arrow, is, says it happened uh, before. So A happened before B. Uh, 
But what if there's like two processes, right? So what, how do you define that? Is basically, you're, let's say you're able to somehow send the messaging, right? Uh, so the sending of the message is an event. A reception of the message is also an event. And the, it says that when the message was received, the, it's assumed that you know, the reception of the message, uh, like the sending of the message happens before B. So similarly, you can draw this exact same arrow here. And this is how distributed events work. All right, to summarize in like more like a easier to write fashion, it's like A arrow B, and A not arrow B means A does not happen before B. What's interesting is that the using this, you can actually almost like a mathematically define the definition of what concurrent means. In this definition, concurrent means that two distinct events, A and B, are concurrent if neither you know, A happens before B, nor B happens before A. Sometimes this is called like independent uh, events, but I think concurrent kind of like sounds cool, right? because people think of it in terms of time. So what this means is that in the distributor system sense, Concurrency is actually about causal effect, right? Because if two events, if there, there's no causality bef between those two, these are called concurrent. So coming back to kind of functional programming, um, how do you express this concept in functional programming is the uh, applicative functor, um, I don't want to get too much into this because the applicative functor itself probably will be like a really great talk, which there actually is, uh, I, which I linked call all the, all the things you traverse uh, by uh, Luca uh, last year's uh, Scala Days talks about this. He called it the uh, the monoidal functor. Um, so basically, you, think, you can think of it as map n, right? In this uh, the code snippet I wrote. You have like three dot sum or like a sum of three and two dot sum, and you're adding those two things. So that's basically all there is to it. Uh, but if you think about what these two things are, two and three, they're in a box, right? And they don't really see each other. They, it doesn't matter if they happen before or, you know, they are basically expressed as some, something that's happening sort of concurrently. And compare this against, uh, for comprehension, which is basically a, like a you know you know like a flat map basically right. So if in using flat map, everything is sort of like sequ sequential, right? It's like because there's a potential at which the value that was returned from the first might be used in the next. So the semantics of the monad is basically similar to like a procedural syntax, essentially, and Haskell uses do, and in Scala, we use for, right? So if you can draw, like, the, uh, the lamp ports arrow, the, there is an arrow from, like, get line, and then to print line, and then get line again, something like that. So you can almost write it as a procedural code, right? Compare this against the uh, build SVT, basically. Uh, I kind of wrote this out using the older uh, SBT 0.12 style to kind of emphasize the connection to the applicative functor. So you have a tuple of compile and compile and some like made up function called, I mean the task name bar, right? There was this thing called like tuples and then you can type map. And these two things, C and B, would happen essentially concurrently because you know this it's happening in tuple and then combining these two effects you do something else and then you put that into foo. Uh, this was kind of like it makes sense once you understand this but it was kind of difficult as an introductory thing to kind of get into. So SBT1 or I mean 0 013 introduced this dot value macro. Uh, in a way, it's good and bad because kind of like it hides these aspects under the rug. So like you don't fully reach the understanding of what's kind of happening, but that value is pretty much doing what's written above. So that's basically an applicative composition that's happening. And 
if you draw like a, this diagram a little better, like I think it will be easier to understand. So similarly, the time goes upward, right? So you have compile slash compile that's in a box, bar also in a box, and interestingly, like these two tasks are, is happening before foo. So there is sort of like a line in the sand of a time space almost. So which means that by the time this opening curly brace of the foo is hit, compilation is already done. So in the build SBT DSL, that value is not a function call. It's basically a declaration that your task depends on the other task. And this can be actually composed, you know, multiple layers, basically. And so if you have like a test test, that depends on compile, which is typically how tests are, right? Like it's internally depending transitory on your compilation. And then you also depend on some other foo task. Um, these things basically com compose. So wh what's the point of this, right? Like why are we doing this like a DAG, like a graph? And it's basically like this concept called minimality. And that is when you're running a command, the task is executed at most once and for the input that was changed, right? The SPT doesn't fully do the second part <laughs> uh, for some of the other tasks. Um, but the, uh, if you think about what that means, so like let's substitute it instead of dot value. Let's say, imagine this was like a function call or something like that, right? So there's like a function named compile. What would happen is that the uh, comp compile would just run like three, four, five different times every time it needs to be like called, right? If it's just a pure function. Because like a foo is, is call calling compile, test is calling compile, you know, like some other jarring and whatever is calling compile. So in order to avoid that, uh, you want to basically calculate, um, sort of like in a way, like a, if you can think of it as a caching mechanism, that compile during the course of a single run of a command uh, is called exactly uh, once. The second part, right, that kind of like makes it more interesting, and that's why I was mentioning this whole time thing, is if you can calculate that certain tasks are essentially independent or concurrent, uh, you can do parallel processing. And SPT does this by default automatically, just by looking at the graph of tasks. Uh, it will concurrently or in parallel process your tasks. And finally, we can kind of talk about what ACT command is doing. Uh, there's like a minor details um, called the aggregate thing. Like if you've done the, the multiple project thing, uh, you've seen this thing called aggregate. Uh, what it's doing is that when you type compile, uh, it basically broadcasts the task processing to the current sub-project as well as the ones that's listed in the aggregate list. So if you're in the root, in this case, it will aggregate util compile, core compile, and the root compile, basically. Uh, and then it basically does a parallel processing of the particular task uh, that was typed in. And that's what ACT command is doing. So how does this kind of relate back to like the state diagram I was writing, right? So this is kind of how conceptually I think of the what's happening. I mean, this might not be exactly like this, but like, so first there is this command called reload, uh, which actually is what happens when you boot up SBT itself. And that basically sets a bunch of settings, right? So setting itself is also in the, like a DAG graph. And then it goes, goes to like S0 state, like your initial state when SBT says hello, okay, it's ready to do some stuff. Uh, that's when all the, your settings are now initialized and evaluated using the DAG. Um, and then you type something in there, then it will basically parallel process a bunch of tasks and then goes to S1. And then you type something else, 
and you go to S2, right? So this is kind of like a distinguish, uh, distinction between setting versus uh, tasks, basically, is the, the task is the one that would like the, uh, get fired up once you like, issue the commands. So if your plugin authors uh, prefer tasks uh, for the plugin extensions, because this is basically automatically composable, um, and command is stateful and it's sequential. But if you want something sequential, command might actually be exactly what you've been looking for, right? Like if you think about release procedure, this is something you want something to be like really sequential. Like even if it takes a little bit of time, you want to tag things, you want to test things, you want to release things, right? So I actually have like a few like custom command I use only for releasing things. But for majority of the times, I think task is a really good, good place to start. Um, second, the, uh, this is one of the things we've been working on a lot in the uh, SPT 1.3. Uh, and it's like we've improved in the last, like uh, you know, recently, is a tilde command. So remember the whole like uh, the water thing that you have to hand crank to type compile or something every time. And let's say you just want to like just let SBT say test all the time or compile all the time. Tilda is actually a really great way to basically say tilde test quick. Test test quick is basically a command a task that runs only the failed task and whatever that was changed. So it's essentially incremental tester. So tilde test quick. Uh, if you kind of like remember one thing, this is a pretty great way. And SPT 1.3 uses uh, native code to look into the file system on Mac, Linux, and Windows and detects any file changes and then shoots it off. So combine this with the turbo mode, it gives really great experience of just like running tests uh, anytime you save the file. So to kind of like dive a little bit into the, the state, right? No, because I've mentioned the word build structure a little bit. Uh, maybe I'll just kind of give like a quick overview of what, what's inside of the build structure. Uh, I don't think there's anything super surprising, but there's like a weird behaviors. Uh, you know, people may have kind of vague ideas, so I'm just going to clarify what's happening. So build structure, basically, there is like build, there's each build has associated URI. Uh, URI typically is your just like your you know absolute path in your desk basically, but it can actually potentially refer to other places in the desk to have like a multiple uh, build, which is called the uh, source dependency. Uh, I have a plugin named SPT Sriracha that's able to switch between the source dependency and the binary dependency if you want to check it out. Um, build mostly is uh, like you can think of it as a set of subprojects and the key value store. And subproject consists pretty much of like a Scala version, which sometimes I call it like axis of evil because it's the one that kind of mutates, acts like an axis, but it's actually not. Um, and uh, configuration. All right, what's configuration? Configuration is like what you see like as compile, runtime, test. Uh, you can make your custom ones, but I generally recommend you don't really make too many of these. And the, what makes a configuration versus something that's not? My test is that if it has its own source code and if it has its own dependency graph, it's likely uh, it's a configuration, right? So test is a great example, right? Because it has its own test as a source code and it has test has its own like the dependency graph, but it kind of like has this kind of like intrinsic relationship with uh, you know in the compile. Runtime is the one that you use like as a provided and stuff like that, where some things are not available during the runtime, but you want to use it only during the compile. So there's a slight distinction between the uh, run and compile, but mostly you think about compile and test, right? So there is the uh, extension like the extends relationship. Test extends runtime and runtime extends compile. And then there's this KVE store. 
Key value store, uh, basically you have name, version, organization, like your use, you know, usual, like the setting kind of stuff. Um, but we actually scope these things in different like dimensions. So you can say this build version, this build organization, or foo, compile, compile, or something like that. Like, and these basically will have distinct values for each of the different like scopings. So let's kind of dive into the, the scoping, because uh, this is kind of like a more confusing part, I think, about SBT, is that there is basically three scopings uh, in SBT. Uh, the maximum you can have is like this, like foo, compile, console, scholarly options, right? Um, and first is a sub-project. Um, this is pretty clear, right? You have sub-project um, as an axis, and you don't have to specify it, then it actually goes to the current project. So typically when you start name, that means it's current project's name. So if you say this build, this build is, um, actually you can think of it as a special sub-project. You can scope things in. So if you want to have a setting that's common to all your sub-projects, uh, that's the one that I typically use. Like a, version number, or Scala version, or like any of these like uh, Sonotype publishing settings, you want to probably scope it in this build uh, so that you don't have to like re-specify it inside each uh, sub-project. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work because there is like overriding rules and all that stuff, but this build is pretty good. Zero is one that you don't usually see as a build author, uh, but like if you're plugin authors, you want to be kind of be aware of the its existence. Uh, it's basically the older like a name was global, but global was kind of a bit confusing, so I renamed it to zero. Global basically is zero slash zero slash zero. Uh, so for a sing single axis, it's zero. Configuration, again, we talked about like compile and test. It's pretty clear. In task is kind of like a weird one where you can scope a setting to a specific task. Uh, again, this typically you see this more as like a plugin settings, but the console slash Scala C option is kind of like, yeah, it's a Scala C option that gets activated only during console task. All right, so yeah, I, I already talked about the fact that keys are automatically scoped to current subproject, right? The other stuff basically default to zero. So let's say, if you type name, that's basically foo. Let's say current project is foo, so it's foo slash name. And the other you know, axis basically default to zero, so it's foo zero zero name. Um, so that's basically that. So what's the point of key value store, right? Um, so I mean, apart from the fact that we use this for this whole applicative composition thing, one of the interesting thing about this fact that we have this explicit key and value is like SPT is actually able to self-inspect what the build looks like. Like you can do that by typing inspect. Uh, so if you type inspect test, that will basically point at what SPT would eventually resolve that uh, particular command into a specific key and what that task depends on and what's the delegation ordering. And if you type inspect tree test, it basically comes up with this like ASCII art. It's like one of the first thing I think I contributed to SBT was to display this thing. It just repetitively calls the uh, inspect and finds out uh, what the transitive task uh, test would call. And this kind of goes into you know, many pages probably. So another th kind of interesting aspect, let's say compared to like Maven or something, is that the, uh, because it's these like, key and value, you can like reassign these or rewire these. Kind of gives you like almost like a super flexible extensibility extension points. If you want to like customize tests or customize compilation or customize all sorts of things, it's like it's right there for you to just switch it up basically. And also the plugins themselves uh, they also expose certain extension points, right? So there's like web jars and like a play and all these different things. These are a lot of times implemented partially as a SBT plugin. You can then customize the behavior of them. 
uh, which is kind of more difficult if there's like a specific phases, like in like a Maven's case. Uh, you kind of have to like make sure you know what other plugins are doing before you or after you and stuff like that, right? So the setting expressions uh, is pretty basic. Uh, you know, the you have some sort of key, an operator, and the body. The operators uh, we recommend are colon equals, plus equals, and plus plus equals. There used to be more, but typically we recommend these three. Um, and what's kind of like, it's not super clear, is this is essentially like a command, right? Because we're changing the state of the build. So in, in a way, you can think of this as you're issuing like a set command. So this is like you start off with like a blank slate, and individual setting expressions is actually mutating the state a little bit. I mean, this happens like when we load, so it's not explicitly doing that. But if you can kind of mentally think of it as like these are like a you know changing of the internal build state. So the setting expression itself, you know, you can use a scoping like this. So like builds this build slash organization and dot value is the one that basically looks it up, and then, you know, we talked about this whole DAG relationship. The tricky part is next. Um, how do they delegate, right? So when you have something like core, test, console, scale C options, um, there is a specific rule that SBT uses. It's like I, can't, like I tried to reverse engineer it by like looking at the source code. Uh, and there is like a now documentation in SBT, but the it's basically just five rules, right? Um, so first, it's gonna try really hard to look for this exact four ax you know like a, you know axes thing, right? Core test console scale C options. But what if it's not there? Um, the first thing it's gonna try is it's gonna get rid of the uh, the in task. And so the substitute that with zero. I, like, I use this dot, dot arrow notation to say it's going to substitute. Uh, so it's core test scale C options is what's going to look first. And then, then what next thing it's going to try is that, okay, like I'm going to put it back. <laughs> so it's going to try, if it's not in test, what if it's in runtime? So it's going to try core runtime, console scale C options, and Compile and then zero, and then eventually it will go up to the you know the sub sub project axis and then try if it's not in core is it in this build is it in zero, so it kind of like goes up these different like routes to almost like an inheritance basically uh, to look for this particular setting value of scala options. What is kind of weird. Um, is that it doesn't, the transitive evaluation doesn't carry its original context. And this is kind of like, if I say this in English, it almost doesn't make sense what I'm talking about, right? So let's, let me kind of like explain this. Is in the object oriented language, there is this concept called like a dynamic dispatch or something where the pointer of this will dispatch into the sub projects method, right? So if you imagine something like this build slash version colon equals name, right? Um, you would kind of expect the name to be the present uh, stuff's name when the version is referred to inside of the uh, lazy bell B projects uh, something task. Um, but that's not how it works in SBT basically. That context, the fact that this version is referred to from B project doesn't carry over. So this build slash version would probably contain the root project's name. Therefore, the something colon equals would end up uh, showing up the root project's name instead of the, this, the B's uh, name. So that's kind of like something you have to remember, essentially, is this makes the fact that the this build or global settings needs to be essentially closed on its own. Uh, this build can only refer to this build settings, and the global can only refer to other global settings only. So that's kind of like a, a little weird things. The other kind of like interesting things, uh, you can kind of take advantage of the, the scoping 
is the how can you make your plugins, if you're a plugin author, maximally flexible, right? So in order to make like a maximal, like a flexible space, as a plugin author, what you should try to do is define your keys in the widest scope, but reference the keys in the narrowest scope, right? So this basically allows the delegation rule to visit you know, three, four different places. So here's like, just kind of like came up with obfuscate as a, you know, like a task. Um, and let's say there is like some sort of like a logic you want to use like algorithm, right? So you want to, as a plugin, provide the obfuscate logic at the global, which is zero, 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 right? And as a default value, but when you actually provide the obfuscate task itself, you scope it inside of the compile because this is a compile obfuscate, and this is automatically scoped again to the current subproject, which then basically allows the your user, uh, the build users, the global this build project and the project compile, like four different places to basically customize the obfuscation logic. So, like, you know, if, you know, in typically you only care about one thing, then you can just say this build slash obfuscate logic and you change it to some other logic. But if you have, like, five different subprojects and you only want one of them to be changed, you can then, the user can scope it and this will work. So there is kind of like, I tried to make the... Uh, <laughs> four-dimensional uh, map. Uh, so this is basically how the visual presentation of how this whole thing works. Um, so there is zero all the way in the center, and the subproject coming this way. So let's kind of look at the subproject first, uh, right? So foo in this particular case, like coming all the way in the bottom of the screen. Um, that's your subproject, so it's like a foo name or foo base directory, right? And then when it can't find the stuff, it goes up to this build and zero, right? And then there's configuration, so anything that depends on the base directory, basically kind of like is on the, the right hand side, I put it like towards the right, so you have something like foo slash compile slash of compile, and then through runtime compile, and through test compile. And then eventually, you have this, like, a, like a hyper axis that's going in task. Uh, so basically, you can, if you can remember the whole delegation rule, you'll first try the foo compile Scala C options, and then if you can't find that, it will just kind of like try traversing this list kind of downward and stuff like that. So kind of like the quickly to summarize the um, like kind of looking ahead to SBT 1.3. I mean, it's not looking exactly ahead ahead because it's now RC2 is there. Um, is the, so one of the fe main features that we shipped is uh, Corsia uh, default is turned on. It's great. And there is this thing called Supershell, which displays a currently uh, executing tasks. Uh, so if you're doing parallel processing, you know, this like, SBT now tells you which two tasks that's uh, parallel processing. And then there's turbo mode that enables the uh, layer class loader. So previously, we were only caching in the sta Scala standard library. Now we would cache, now when the turbo mode is turned on, the class loader for the, uh, the library dependency is also cached. So I definitely encourage you to try the turbo mode. Uh, this makes the test and run task really fast to get up uh, because it doesn't reload and jet, uh, which takes like a few seconds to even longer. Uh, so your test runs up really fast. All right, so this is pretty much what I have. Um, thank you. And the, if you have any questions, maybe I can take one question, but like, I think the lunch is also starting. So if you have questions, uh, I'll take now. But otherwise, uh, you can just come talk to me later. Oh, yeah. Sure. Thank you.
<clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm not sure if I understood uh, correctly the relation, relationship between settings and configurations. So uh, what does it actually mean for a configuration to extend, to extend another configuration? Is the effect only visible in uh, source directories and dependencies or is it also visible in settings? So um, an extending configuration, does an, uh, does the, an extending configuration, configuration inherit settings from an extended configuration? No, uh, there is no automatic uh, setting inheritance. You still have to, as a plugin author, if you make your own configuration, you still have to redefine all the settings. So the part that gets, I think, when you publish to like the palm or something, maybe that part becomes useful to inherit something. But from the point of view of basically traversal, uh, it's basically used to traverse. If it doesn't exist in test, it goes up to compile. Uh, that's where it's mostly relevant. And the, uh, the inheritance doesn't really mean like exactly, uh, I think. Yeah, you, you still have to do a lot of the work yourself if you provide your custom uh, configuration. Okay, so uh, extending is about uh, source directories and dependencies, essentially, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so <laughs> I have a plug. I, I make mixtapes, so <laughs> if you go to my Twitter handle or my website, I have a mixtape I make every three months, so check this out. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.